the fact that on the day we celebrate uh, Pastor Appreciation Day, I get to warn you about false teachers. <laughs> Hopefully we're not talking about me, <laughs> right? God, God keep us from that. But open up your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and we'll read verses 1 through 15 together. Why don't you stand with me as we read the Word of God? Please have your Bibles open anytime you receive teaching from God's Word, because you want to check to see if what the pastor is saying is true. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 1, says, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles, even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one for what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. As the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Let's pray. Father, it is a sobering word that is given here, but I pray that our eyes will be open to it, that our hearts will be attentive to the things that the Spirit has to say to the church today. Guard us, Father, from false teachers who would take our eyes off Jesus and put them on sinful men. Or may our hope always be in Christ and in His simple yet beautiful gospel. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Performing magicians or illusionists, they specialize in the art of deception. They can be entertaining to watch, but what they do really hinges on how well they can deceive their audience. They often do something with one hand while performing some trick of dexterity with the other, and you never see it because they've deceived you, and they get you to look at the thing in front of you. And it's a mystery to those who watch, but you know, behind the scenes, there's always a logical explanation, but it does come down to their skill at deception. Now, of course, deception exists far beyond the stage, and it sadly can infiltrate the church. False teachers bring in false doctrines coming from false gospels, and men and women are tragically led away from Christ into tragedy. It is satanic in its origin, as the devil has always sought out Christians whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5, 8, and it sometimes he finds them. And this was Paul's warning to the Corinthian church. You recall he's returned to the subject of church discipline, and he started out in chapter 10 with a bang. He did not desire to be overly bold or harsh with the Corinthians, but he's willing to go to spiritual war on their behalf if it was required. He was well acquainted with the weapons of spiritual warfare, knowing how to use them with great effectiveness, and use them he would. And this is no empty threat. Although his 
Critics had accused him of weakness, being bold only in his letters. That wasn't the case. The apostle had every intent to be bold in his administration of discipline. He just hoped that it wouldn't be necessary. And so this led to a contrast between Paul and the false teachers whom the church of Corinth had received. They were proud, they were boastful, they were self-promoters, they spoke highly of their own authority, using themselves as their own standard of judgment, which of course is no standard at all. Paul, on the other hand, had legitimate authority exercised within the sphere that God gave him. Paul had no cause to boast in himself, his boast was in the Lord. Now that boast carries over into chapter 11, as Paul continues to detail the differences between his ministry and those of the false teachers. Paul preached the true gospel, being a true apostolic messenger of the living God, but not so with the others. They were nothing short of satanic, with the church of Corinth needing to beware their deception. Now, we need to know that our enemy has not changed. Just in case you need a reminder, we still have an enemy and he, along with those who serve him, hate us, and he still seeks to deceive us unto death. The devil actively seeks Christians whom he may trip up and destroy, so we want to beware. Do not be deceived. Stand fast in the true gospel. Stand fast in the doctrine of Christ. Paul begins this section with this fear of deception with a false gospel in verses 1 through 4. Verses 1 and 2 said this, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. For I betrothed you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. Now, it isn't often that an accomplished apostle starts an argument by asking permission to be foolish, but that's exactly what Paul did. It is, of course, foolish to boast about one's own credentials, puffing up oneself, and view of others. Uh, that's the sort of thing we see in professional wrestling. It's the sort of thing we see in political campaigns. And sometimes you wonder if you could trade out one group of category for the other. <laughs> it has no place within the church, yet this is the position in which Paul found himself. And it would only continue, of course, into the second half of chapter 11. We'll see him continuing it again in chapter 12. It was foolish because a Christian's true boast is only found rightly in the Lord, as Paul noted at the very end of chapter 10. Yet, in this particular circumstance, it was necessary with Corinth. Paul had to draw a contrast between himself and these other false teachers, and because they were boasting in themselves, Paul had to engage in a bit of boasting himself. And there was really only one reason to make him do it, and this was his jealousy. Paul had a godly zeal to see Corinth stand fast as a pure church. And that word for jealous or jealousy might as easily be translated zealous, you might even hear that in the original Greek word, zeloo, zelos, between the, the verb and the noun. So, zealousy, right? Jealousy is an appropriate translation because it's an appropriate emotion when we're talking about the possibility of adultery. And that's what he describes here. As the apostle to the Gentiles, Paul had the responsibility of preparing the church of Corinth with the gospel, preparing them with biblical doctrine that they might be ready to be presented unto Jesus Christ. Now, you might recall, and we say this a lot in wedding ceremonies, that this is how Paul described to the Ephesians of Christ's work regarding betrothal and his marriage to the church, right? We read in Ephesians 5, 26 and 27, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word that he might present to himself a glorious church. See, Paul was Jesus' instrument to do exactly that with the church at Corinth, used by the Lord to cleanse that church, to prepare that church through God's own word, to see God face to face. And just like any servant that's entrusted with the opportunity and the responsibility of guarding the bride of his master might be jealous for her purity, so is Paul with and for this church. We see the same thing. Earthly fathers are jealous to guard the purity of their daughters. So was the apostle with the church. One day he would stand before Jesus to give account of his care over this congregation. And it was a sobering thought for him to consider that he might have to say, I'm sorry, Lord Jesus, though I betrothed Corinth to you through preaching the gospel and discipling them in biblical doctrine, they committed adultery and they left you for something else. Now, although there's a promise that Jesus is going to wipe every tear from our eyes in heaven, the prospect of looking Jesus face to face and apologizing for Corinth's unfaithfulness must have shook Paul to his core. Let me suggest to you that it's the same way with every faithful pastor and shepherd. Not every man who holds the 
title of pastor is God-fearing, but for those who are, and there are many, they never forget the clear warning of Jesus' half-brother James, that teachers of God's word will receive a stricter judgment, James 3.1. We will answer for the congregations under our care. We will answer for the sermons we gave, the doctrine we taught, whether it was faithful to God's word. And pastors who forget this do themselves a grave disservice. And it's not only their congregations that's going to suffer, but they're going to have to look Jesus face to face and give an account for those things. Now, speaking personally, and so you know this, this is something that weighs heavily on me every time I prepare a sermon. I, I, this is the reason I, it frightens me to think that I might take God's word out of context. I don't want to stretch the meaning of Scripture to make it more than what it has to say. But neither do I take my responsibility lightly for you. Remember that churches do not belong to their pastors. You belong to the Lord Jesus. Jesus is our chief shepherd. Jesus truly is our pastor, the chief shepherd. Every other pastor ever in the church, we're just under shepherds. So it isn't my job to get you to meet my needs. It's my job to prepare you to see Jesus. And it's to Jesus that I will be held accountable for that. So I am jealous for you. And if that comes across sometimes, know it comes from a heart that is soberly looking forward to seeing Jesus. Jealous for you for right doctrine. This was Paul's concern for Corinth, which led him to some understandable uncertainty. Verse 3, but I fear lest somehow as a serpent deceive Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Paul understand, and you might know, he's not normally somebody given over to fear. This wasn't a guy who cowered in the corner when threats assailed him. He he didn't give in to fear-mongering that's imposed on him by others. But when it came to the church congregations he planted and that he loved, he had some legitimate fears. He feared for them. And in this case, he feared that the church might give in to satanic corruption of the gospel. Just like Satan long ago had deceived Eve in the Garden of Eden, tempting her to eat of the fruit of the one tree that God forbade, uh, Satan does the same thing today. Satan slithers his way among the children of God, craftily deceiving men and women regarding the simplicity of the gospel. And just as he did in the garden, he corrupts what God gave as good. And just like our ancestors, we give in to Satan's corruption far too easily. Now, before we get too far into this, and I I do want to plumb this a little bit, please note just as an aside, Paul does affirm the Genesis account. For those who write off the initial chapters of Genesis as myth, The New Testament does not do so. Whenever Jesus or Paul or whomever speak of Adam, Eve, Noah, the events surrounding them, they they refer to these things as history, not as fictional morality tales. Now, is someone's view of Genesis something upon which their salvation rests? No, of course not. But the way you view Genesis reveals much about what you believe about the rest of the Bible, whether you believe it is the genuine Word of God. And without the Word of God, you're deprived of the authority of God leaving you open to every wind of doctrine. And that's a very dangerous place in which to be. But back to what Paul was saying. Consider this word corrupted. In classical Greek, the word was often used to describe something being morally corrupted. Might use to say to bribe, to seduce a woman, to to, to defile a a, a virgin. That was how this word corrupted was used. Earlier, elsewhere, we should say, the, the word is used to describe destruction. We see this in Paul's earlier letter to Corinth regarding how God would destroy those who would defile the temple of God, 1 Corinthians 3, 17. He uses that same word for corruption, for destruction there. So you put it together, we have a word that refers to an inner corruption that leads to an outward destruction. Not exactly a good combination of things. Right? This is dangerous. And what was the danger? The danger was that the Corinthians might experience this corruption regarding the simplicity that is in Christ. The false teachers might deceive the Corinthians in such a way that the pure, simple gospel is spoiled and defiled. Consider the simplicity of the good news of Jesus. As good as it is, as we mentioned yesterday in the memorial service, it can be summed up in a single verse. We remember John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's one verse that just sums up the gospel in a nutshell. And that's not the only summarizing scripture. We can think also of, uh, whoa, we can think also, there we go, of Romans 10, verse 9. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, either one of these verses emphasizes the gospel simplicity. Now, keep in mind that simple does not mean simplistic, right? You could spend months, if not years, mining the depths of what it means that 
you know, in the incarnation that Jesus is God's only begotten son, you still never cover it all. And that's only one part of that verse. Likewise, with the wonder of the cross and with the resurrection, it is by no means a simplistic gospel. It's not a shallow gospel, but it is simple. How does one receive everlasting life? By believing upon Jesus as the Son of God sent for us. How is somebody saved? By confessing with our mouths that Jesus is Lord, believing that Jesus is risen from the dead. That's what it takes. We need no special catechism. We do not need ecclesiastical dispensation. We don't need intricate church ritual blessed by some priest or pope. We only need faith in the biblical Jesus crucified for our sins and risen from the dead. If the thief on the cross next to Jesus could have the assurance of life through simple faith, so can you, so can I. Amen. Yet it was this simple, pure gospel that was being corrupted for the Corinthians in ways that Paul soon describes. Now, before we get there, we might ask the question, how far away might the Corinthians be corrupted from the simple gospel? Might their faith, using the word in his context, might their faith actually be destroyed? Based on Paul's urgent tone in the overall context, Paul seemed to think so. He was concerned for the Corinthian salvation. Paul feared that they might veer so much from the true gospel that they end up in utter apostasy. And it's no wonder with that in mind that Paul was willing to go to spiritual war on their behalf. He was literally fighting a, a battle of life and death for this church congregation. Would they abide in Jesus unto life, or would they fall away from him in doctrines of destruction? Paul was not willing to sit back on the sidelines to see how things might play out. Like a jealous father for his child, he's going to jump into the fray seeking to protect this church from the satanic attack against it. Now, the theological debates regarding eternal security have endured for literally centuries, almost 500 years. Does a Christian have immediate and everlasting assurance of salvation, or is it possible for someone to fall away from grace unto perdition? It is not my intent to answer the debate with this, because our immediate text does not deal with it. But what it does address is apostasy. And regardless what anyone believes about eternal security, the biblical warnings against apostasy are clear and abundant. We see one right here. It is possible for those who claim faith in Christ to walk away from Christ. And we need not search deep recesses of history, for example, as most of us know people firsthand who've done this thing. Men and women who once professed faith, even going to Bible studies, even declaring their faith in Jesus through baptism, yet now they're fallen to a lifestyle of sin, hardly demonstrating any current love of Jesus, not demonstrating any fear of God. Now, we ask our question, we debate, were they false converts in the beginning, or did they lose what they once had? I suggest to you the question is irrelevant. What matters is what's going on right now, their current lack of faith. They are not currently abiding in Christ. And guess what? It's only in Christ that our assurance is found. So the application here is simple and it's plain. Do not depart from the faith. Stay rooted, stay grounded in Christ, never taking for granted how Jesus died for you and lives today. He and He alone is our hope of salvation. If our hope of heaven is not based solely on Jesus, we have no hope at all. So we abide in Him, clinging tightly to Him. And guess what? When you do that, you'll find that He grips you a lot tighter than you're gripping Him. Now, as for Corinth, the danger is that they would not. The teachers that they had willingly received into their congregation corrupted the simple gospel to something sinister. Look at verse 4. For if he who comes preaches another Jesus whom we've not preached, or if you receive a different spirit which you have not received, or a different gospel which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. See, Paul's fear from verse 3 has two ramifications. First ramification, different gospels were preached. There were proclamations of different Jesuses, possibility of different spirits other than the Holy Spirit of God, declaration of different gospels. It's astounding when we stop to think of it, because, you know, for us, nearly 2,000 years later, it's relatively easy for us to understand how the message of Christ is corrupted in so many various ways. Well, you had 2,000 years to have all kind of myriad forms of uh, uh, distraction and corruption. But, you know, Paul was writing to Corinth only a few decades after Jesus' resurrection, Paul had personally introduced these men and women to the gospel within the past year plus. 
And already there were false gospels and doctrines being taught among them. And nor was this only unique to Corinth. You might remember Paul noted something similar with the Galatians, Galatians 1, 8, and 9. But even if we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we've said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. The churches in the region of Galatia were specifically infiltrated, we know this from the book of Galatians, they were specifically infiltrated by the Judaizers, a sect of legalistic, quote, Christians, that believe that a person needed to be a good Jew before he or she could become a good Christian. So, you know, for men, the circumcision needed to be kept, the feasts needed to be kept, the traditions needed to be honored, and all the rest. All that needed to take place if anybody was going to have any assurance of salvation. Now, that kind of teaching could have all kinds of labels, but gospel is not one of them. Anything that adds human work to the work of Jesus at the cross and the resurrection is a corruption of the simplicity of Christ. Because salvation, as we celebrate on Reformation Day, salvation is the work of Christ alone. And anything that we do, including repentance and faith, by the way, anything we do is merely a response to Jesus' already completed work. And this is why the gospel is called the gospel. It's called the good news of Christ. It's the good news that the Son of God died for our sins and rose from the grave. It's good news that anyone who turns to Jesus in repentance and faith can be saved. It's good news that God offers true forgiveness of sin through Jesus, Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. That is good news. And anything else that takes away from that is bad. It's some other news, news that leads away from eternal life into eternal perdition and death. And this is what was going on at Corinth. Paul put an if in verse 4, but the if was not hypothetical. He was not imagining some potential danger that might befall Corinth. He was referring to something actually taking place. Grammatically, the if is what's called a first-class condition, uh, meaning that it was presumed as true. Paul knew from experience the type of teachers that had come into Corinth, along with all the potential dangers. And the things they taught, took people away from the biblical Jesus, the true Jesus, by adding their traditions, by adding their philosophies, by adding their rituals, whatever it was, they taught of a Jesus whose offer of salvation was dependent on men and their knowledge and their spiritualized experiences and all the rest, deluding and distorting the true gospel of God. Now, this danger of Jesus' replacement did not end with Corinth. Consider how various cults and religions view Jesus today. This might make some people uncomfortable, but we're going to just dive into it today, and we're going to name some names. The Jehovah Witnesses see Jesus as a created being, as a God, but not the Almighty God. That's a different Jesus. The Mormons also believe that Jesus is less than fully God, being the firstborn Son of God, but they teach all people are sons and daughters of God. Jesus is just, though, not the unique Son of God. He's less than fully God. Islam teaches that Jesus was not a sinless prophet, or he was a sinless prophet, but he was not the son of God. Islam teaches that he wasn't even crucified. Even the modern day woke social justice Christians see Jesus differently, painting him to be a revolutionary and social activist, but not the holy God calling people to true repentance. Now, these are corruptions of the real Jesus. They're not even different versions of the same Jesus seen from different perspectives. They're different Jesus figures entirely. They are false Jesus figures proclaiming false gospels that lead to empty hopelessness and to death. Now, if the first ramification is different gospels and versions of Jesus preached in Corinth and elsewhere, the second ramification is that those different gospels might actually be believed. Notice how he ended verse 4. You may well put up with it. You know, it was bad enough that these false gospels were preached. Paul no doubt expected wolves to come in after him, trying to pick off the sheep. But what made it immeasurably worse is when the sheep welcomed the wolves, said, come on over for dinner. For the Corinthian Christians to welcome these false teachers and imbibe their corrupted gospels, it was as if they showed themselves willing and ready to see how much poison they can drink before they drop dead. And that's utter foolishness. These gospels, these false gospels are not to be entertained. They're to be marked and avoided. And once again, the errors of Corinth carry over today. How often do born again believing Christians endure false teaching they know is false, finding excuses to justify it? 
Well, I know that guy on TV is fake, but boy, does he pump me up and he makes me feel good. Yeah, I know this Catholic church, this Mormon congregation preaches a, a false gospel, but I don't mind being with them because at least they're voting the right way. Beloved, we, we need to stop making excuses and stop putting up with purveyors of false gospels. And the more we abide by it, the more likely we will imbibe it for ourselves. The more justifications we make, the more we desensitize our hearts to their false teaching. That's a road to danger which must be avoided. We need to beware the possibility of deception. It would come through the form of a false gospel. It comes through the medium of false apostles and other teachers. And that's the other part of this section here, verses 5 through 15, where Paul's writing about the fall, fear of deception by false apostles. He writes in verses 5 and 6, For I consider that I am not at all inferior to the most eminent apostles. Even though I am untrained in speech, yet I am not in knowledge. But we have been thoroughly manifested among you in all things. Here we see, I just got to love it, Paul's gift of sarcasm. Uh, just coming through it in full blast here regarding these self-proclaimed super apostles. Now it should be noted, I'll be faithful to the, the debate here, it should be noted that that interpretation is disputed. Some consider Paul's reference to the most eminent apostles not to sarcastically point to the false apostles, but to actual apostles within the rest of the church. And in that argument, Paul determined that he's not inferior to the twelve in Jerusalem, those who were handpicked by Jesus. After all, Paul was also handpicked by Jesus, though at a later time. Yet I suggest that interpretation seems highly unlikely in the overall context. Throughout this section, Paul is highlighting the various wrongs and the dangers brought by the false teachers. Moreover, in verse 6, he defends himself against the charges of being unschooled in Greek and Roman rhetoric. Well, guess what? So were the twelve. They weren't educated in that either. The majority of Jesus' original apostles were fishermen. Few, if any of them, had Greek Hellenized education. Thus, it seems far more likely that Paul used sarcasm to refer to the false teachers in Corinth. The most eminent apostles were the teachers who commended themselves, measuring themselves by themselves, as we saw in chapter 10. And they did not only see themselves as exalted and worthy, but if you're looking at the Greek behind most eminent, it's like they were the most exalted. They were the exalted among the exalted ones really puffing themselves up. And to them, Paul says, well, I'm not inferior to them. He wasn't afraid to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Not that he's puffing up his own resume, but he's not going to allow himself to be pushed aside by these proud, heretical know-it-alls. Now, he notes here that he's qualified, perhaps not in rhetoric, but in knowledge. Now, regarding speech, or regarding the Greek academic ideas concerning rhetoric, Paul was untrained. I love the word he uses here because it's literally idiotic. Idiotes. Not my word, it's Paul's word, right? He's calling himself an idiot when it comes to these things. And this was the source of complaints from others being that the Greek culture found entertainment in how well someone spoke. And they, they loved to hear orators express their ideas in lofty language. And that wasn't Paul. That wasn't who he was. That wasn't who he cared to be. For all the preaching that he did, he was obviously no novice when it came to public speaking, but his calling was not to make the gospel sound as pretty as possible. It was to make it sound as plain as possible. Paul spoke for the purpose of understanding. When he spoke publicly, it was so that Jesus would be made known, not for people to be amazed at his own speech. You might remember from his earlier letter, he said that, I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified, 1 Corinthians 2.2. 2. He wasn't using persuasion. He wasn't using human strategies. He proclaimed a simple gospel, demonstrated the power of God through conversion. And he says here that this is what was manifested, thoroughly manifested among them. For all the complaints he might have received about his lack of higher oratory, Paul's actions were clearly seen. He had lived among these people, you might recall, for 18 months. We saw that in Acts 18, verse 11. Maintained a relationship with them long after. Anything they wanted to know about Paul, they had full access to him. Right? He was no secret to them. He was as plain as day. And that should be a good thing. Yet people still found reason to criticize. Verse 7, did I commit sin and humbling myself that you might be exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you free of charge. You say, well, what might Paul's sin have been against Corinth? From our perspective today, if the apostle Paul desired to teach and disciple people free of charge, we, we would be overjoyed. In our culture, far too much emphasis is put on money, so it's refreshing to find a Christian teacher who's not begging for it. But for Corinth and their culture, they saw things differently. For them, 
you know, paying the preacher was a way for them to participate in the, the blessing and the work. And to some extent, there's truth in that, right? For instance, we can't all travel physically to the mission field in foreign lands, but we can give money to those who do, and thus we share with them in their work and in the ministry. We'll likewise share in their heavenly reward, right? That's part of it. That's good. That's joyful. That's something that's known of us as, as Christians. But many preachers abuse this good, and Paul is trying to avoid that abuse. Thus, we have here Paul's potential sin against Corinth was that he didn't give them this opportunity to participate with him. Now, the accusation rings hollow, because even if he didn't take their money, he couldn't be rightly accused of sin. When children are young, do parents expect payment for food and clothing? And when they get older, you might ask, hey, you need to pay some rent and start pulling your weight around here. But when they're young, not at all. And that's how Paul saw his relationship with Corinth. They were still far too immature, and he was still providing for them as a faithful parent. Now, keep in mind, he never denied the fact that he had a right to get paid. He just chose to deny himself that right for the good of the congregation. We read that in 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Yet it was for this act of personal sacrifice that people accused him of sin. And you want to talk about sin? Well, look at verse 8. I robbed other churches taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you and in need, I was a burden to no one for our, what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I kept myself from being burdensome to you, and so I will keep myself. He, his financial support came from other churches. See, Paul was paid. He just wasn't paid by Corinth. Now, he uses a bit of hyperbole here describing his payment, writing that he robbed other churches, like as if he's plundering them like a raiding pirate. But if the Corinthians wanted to accuse him of financial sin, that they couldn't look to themselves as victims, they'd have to look to the Macedonians. Obviously, Paul had no sin against them, right? That wasn't the point. They willingly, they joyfully sent financial support to Paul for the specific purpose of him continuing the missionary journey. But even so, Paul understood that those finances could have been used elsewhere, right? That's why he's got this illustration of, of robbing. They could have used it to support things going on in Macedonia, but they sent it to me instead. Now, remember, even with the financial support that was received from Macedonia, Paul, he had times that he wasn't always paid. In fact, on his initial arrival to Corinth, and we'll read about this in Acts chapter 18, he was bivocational. He was a tent maker. That's actually where he met Aquila and his wife Priscilla. Now, this was likely his meaning in verse 9 when he writes that he was a burden to no one when he was present among them. When he first got to town, he doesn't delay preaching the gospel, but neither did he delay getting a job. He didn't show up in town with an expectation that, you know, God's just going to miraculously feed him hand to mouth like he did with Elijah, nor did he place any burdens on the new believers as they came to faith. No, Paul is mature enough to understand he needed to be willing to work with his own hands and pay his own bills, knowing that God still provided for him. Sometimes God provided through the church. Other times God provided through his employer. Either way is good. Either way was of the Lord. By the way, some of you weren't here early on when we first got started, but we did something similar here. For the first five years of, of uh, this church being planted, I was a bivocational. It was impossible for a fledgling church to support a full-time pastor. Now, the church was loving, abundantly generous, but, you know, there's only so much that a small group of people can do. And guess what? I believe there was a lot of value in those early years. There are lessons I learned during those days I couldn't have learned any other way. And I think it somewhat sad, and I see it more and more today, that many young pastors are unwilling to experience bivocational ministry. Some of them are not willing to go to a church that isn't able to pay them full time. In the process, they miss out on wonderful opportunities for spiritual growth. And there's other churches out there that miss out on receiving a biblically sound pastor. Of course, on the flip side, there is a difference right, between being generously supported by a congregation and being a wayward pastor that's fleecing the flock of God. When certain ministers claim mansions as parsonages, and Lear jets as necessities, something is terribly wrong. That is going beyond even being a burden. That's downright abuse. We need to be able to recognize the difference between those things. But Paul's basic point is that he wasn't a burden to the church. Not only did Paul not see this as sin, he's determined to keep on doing it. He's not going to be dissuaded from it. Verse 10, as the truth of Christ is in me, no one shall stop me from this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows. But what I do, I will also continue to do, that I may cut off the opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the things of which they boast. So Paul's plan would not change. He had been financially independent from the church of Achaia to this point. When we say Achaia, we're talking southern Greece, modern Greece, with Corinth being in that region. 
He has every invitation and determination to continue in this fashion. Now, was this a lack of love towards Corinth? Of course not. Again, he loved this church like a father loves his children, wanting the best for them, desiring them to grow into maturity. And because he loved them, he wanted the focus of his relationship with them to be on Jesus, not on money. And in the regions of Achaia, money was a distraction. Understand that every new teacher that came to town proclaiming some new philosophy, proclaiming some new religion, expected to get paid. And the way it went on is that people would give a few teachings for free, drawing in some students, and then demand payment to pay the rest. Well, I only got you halfway there. If you really want to know the secret of life, buddy, you better fork it over. Paul didn't want that to be an obstacle to the gospel. He wanted to freely give because it had been freely received. Moreover, this is a way to distinguish him and true gospel ministry from that of the false teachers. For all of the folks among Corinth attempting to put themselves on the same level as Paul, claiming that they're the most eminent apostles, the differences between their behavior and Paul are demonstrated that they didn't act like it. If the church had difficulty distinguishing between the truth and the light, at least in the doctrines that were taught, then surely they would be able to see the difference in the way that these people acted. If they didn't act like the original true Christian evangelists and teachers they've received in the past, it ought to serve as a warning that they were not true Christian teachers and evangelists. And these were false teachers. Look at verse 13. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. Paul pulls no punches in this description. These teachers are not super apostles, they're pseudo apostles. By the way, that term is literal. It was a word that Paul invented to describe them. Pseudo apostolos, pseudo apostles. And just in case the Corinthians are unclear as to what Paul meant, he defines it for them. These men are liars, deceitful workers. They did not teach the truth, nor did they portray the truth. It would have been bad enough for men sent out by the apostles to uh, you know, teach false doctrine, sent out from Jerusalem to various corners of the world and then teaching false doctrine. That would have been bad enough. It's far worse for them to pretend they had apostolic legitimacy and then teach false doctrine on top of it. But that's exactly what they did. And so it's no wonder that Paul here drops the use of sarcasm, no longer going along with their pretense of being super apostles. He says they're not super apostles, they're pseudo apostles, they're fakes, they're counterfeits, they're liars. Moreover, they're disguised. Paul said that they were transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. That word for transformed is important because it's repeated three times in these last three verses here in various grammatical forms. Verse 13, verse 14, verse 15. And what makes it interesting is that there's a different word here than uh, another New Testament reference to transformation because usually when Christians think of transformation, we go back to Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Right, when Paul exhorts the believers not to be conformed to the image of this world, but to be transformed by the renewing of our minds. Now, in that case, the word for transformation is taken from the same Greek word that we get our word metamorphosis, referring to a total transformation from inside out, like a caterpillar undergoes metamorphosis to turn into a butterfly, you know, this total change beginning on the inside. So our born-again believers transformed by the word of God working within our minds and our spirits. The word here. And 2 Corinthians chapter 11 is different. This refers not to an inward transformation, but an outward change. It's an altered version of the word schema. You might hear the word schematic in there, which the Greek saw as the outward structure or form that may be known by the senses. It refers to the outside, the physical structure. The particular form of this word in verse 13 refers to the changes that take place in the outward appearance. So in context, the idea here is that the false apostles could easily change what's on the outside without changing what's on the inside. They changed their form, not their character. They may have disguised themselves as apostles, but it didn't change the fact that they were wolves among the sheep. Just because someone looks good does not mean that what they teach is good. Stephen Furtick was just in the headlines again, tweeting out, following Jesus does not change you into something else. It reveals who you've been all along. Now, considering that who we are without Christ, our wretched sinner is in need of new spiritual birth that leads to forgiveness and eternal life. Considering that God promises to make us new creations when we follow Jesus. Considering that God's word does transform us from the inside out that we might continually follow Jesus. Then Furtick's tweet might sound pithy, but it reveals deeply anti-biblical teaching. 
Now, keep in mind, he pastors a church of 26,000 people in the Southern Baptist Convention. He's a guy that looks good, has a huge congregation. But it reveals that he's a deceitful worker, a wolf among the sheep. I name him by name, but the sad ex uh, uh, fact is that the examples don't stop with him. Far too many Christians follow the teachings of Joel Osteen, Joyce Myers, T.D. Jakes, Paula White, and too many others to mention. These are all men and women with high profiles and large audiences. They're interviewed by news media. They're consulted by politicians. They're held up as examples of great Christian teachers, yet they fit the same description as the pseudo-apostles described and encountered by Paul. They're deceitful workers handling God's word with carelessness, leading God's people into spiritual danger. They're to be marked and avoided. People like this are not the only ones wearing a disguise, by the way. They learn to do it from a truly evil example, verse 14 and 15. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. If any of those who might disguise his appearance as from something being evil to something good, Satan stands out at the top of the list, and why wouldn't he? The devil, Jesus made it clear, he's been a liar from the beginning. He's always going to be a liar. So it's ironically true to form that he would deceive others with his appearance. How does he do it? Paul writes that he transforms himself into an angel of light. In other words, he makes himself appear from the outside. Remember, this is an outward change, an outside to be good when inwardly he's really evil. Right? This is this outward transformation. We're talking really about a disguise. At heart, Satan is a murderous liar. Nothing changing that fact, no matter what he looks like on the outside. Now, this would seem to be a theoretical discussion for modern times, except for the fact that Satanists truly do exist. Even right here in Tyler, as we found out not too long ago. Men and women, in their deep rejection of God, make the decision to worship Satan under the guise that he liberates them from biblical morality. Yet what liberation is there to be a slave of sin? What freedom is there in enjoying the pleasures of the flesh today only to be tormented in hell forever? Amen. Satan offers no freedom. He offers only a place alongside him in the lake of fire. Understand he knows well his destiny that God will forever cast him into the lake of fire to be tormented day and night forever. Revelation 20 verse 10. And Satan's primary desire for today is to drag as many people with him there as possible. Now, of course, satanic deception affects far more than just outright Satanists. The devil transforming into an angel of light seems to have been the inspiration behind both Mormonism and Islam. Joseph Smith, the founder of Mormonism, which is also known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, he had encounters with a being he knew as the angel Moroni, who taught him the false gospel and gave him the Book of Mormon. Likewise, in a far earlier century, Muhammad, the founder of Islam, supposedly received revelation from the angel Gabriel, Jibrael, which he said who dictated to him the Koran verse by verse. Yet what did Paul write about angelic messengers who preached another gospel? They're accursed. They're anathema. They're to be damned to hell. This is yet one more reason we need to base our theology on the proven revelation of God rather than testimonial experiences of people who've supposedly received extra-biblical revelation. The Bible is our final source of authority, being the inspired, infallible Word of God to men. And any supposed encounters with angels, demons, visions, dreams, needs to be kept subservient unto the Scripture. Just because somebody thinks they've seen an angel doesn't mean that he or she has done so. They could have just as easily seen the devil in disguise. We cannot judge things solely by their outward appearance. All things must be judged by the Word of God. And just like the devil can disguise himself changing his outward appearance, so can those who serve him, either knowingly or out of ignorance. Satan's messengers, he says here, can also have a deceitful appearance. Paul gives the description of the false or the pseudo-apostles of his day. The description remains true of false teachers today. Deceptive satanic doctrine can easily disguise itself as good, spoken through winsome, charming advocates. Those who teach these things might appear to be ministers of righteousness, yet they bring only evil wickedness. For Paul and Corinth, it was these false teachers bringing a different Jesus and a different gospel leading to a different spirit. They seemingly added to the work of Christ preaching a gospel that wasn't really good news. For us, the danger still exists. It's fitting that we would address this on Reformation Day. The priests and the Pope of Roman Catholicism are held up by our culture as being ministers of righteousness, but they promote a distorted gospel of Jesus, re-sacrificed with every Mass, 
They promote an idolatry of Mary being the co-redemptrix with Christ. With them, salvation is not assured outside of their sacraments. It's a religion of works. And again, on this Reformation Day, it's important for us to note that the issues of deceptive doctrine causing the church to be split 500 years ago have not been resolved. The Catholic Church has not repented of their false teachings, thus, teachings, thus they remain a false church. And with due respect to our friends and neighbors inside the Catholic Church, we plead for them to come out and hear the proclamation of the true gospel that Christ alone saves by grace through faith. And we don't want to just point the fingers outside. False teachers exist within Protestantism as well. We've already named some. To pinpoint certain false teachers and false religions is though not to point fingers and it's not to puff ourselves up as being perfect. It's not to pretend some sort of spiritual superiority. After all, I'm just as much in need of salvation as anyone else or you. We have our own sin that requires forgiveness. We also need to cling tightly to Christ. But I understand we've got to name names if we're to understand the relevance of Paul's teaching for today. Remember when he wrote to Corinth, he wasn't theorizing about things. He wasn't making just rhetorical points. These were real dangers among the church, men of which these Corinthians knew intimately face to face. These words were written as clear warnings which the church was expected to take action on. So too it needs to be with us. One other thought before we close, by the way, about these final teachers. For all their deception, Paul gives clear assurance that the satanic messengers will not forever deceive. One day they will be judged. What do you say? Whose end will be according to their works. Right now, deceivers deceive. That's just what they do. Yet, each of them will one day face the righteous judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. They'll look into his eyes burning with fire and ask for the deception that they wrought on his church, his bride, and it will be terrifying for them in that day. Far better it would be for them to repent now rather than wait for judgment later. Beloved, we need to beware deception. Do not be deceived by false workers teaching false gospel. Sadly, those teachings are just as plentiful today as they were in the days of Corinth, and the destruction that they make within the church is tragic. And this was Paul's warning to Corinth. He feared that the church would get caught up in satanic deception brought by satanic messengers who disguise themselves as something good. They should have known better. This church had been taught solid doctrine by the Apostle Paul. They'd seen his example. They knew the truth. They just needed to abide within it. So do we. We've been given the gospel of Jesus Christ, that God the Son came and lived a perfect life, yet died on the cross as the sufficient sacrifice for our sins. And being risen from the dead, Jesus now offers true forgiveness and life to anyone who will call upon Him and believe. We are called to repent from our sins, trust Christ. It's Christ and Christ alone who saves. That is the good news. That's something from which we should never depart. How we need to keep our eyes on Jesus, our ears on His truth, and our hearts steadfast on Him. Never allow some good-looking, good-sounding teacher to take your attention away from the Bible or to twist it into meaning something that it clearly does not. The better you know your Bible and the better you know Jesus in prayer, the better you know Jesus through true, godly, God-fearing worship, the less likely it is you will be deceived. Now, what if you've been deceived? What if you've walked away from the truth, having your understanding corrupted by some devilish deceiver? Well, praise God that it's not too late to repent. Even today, if you hear these words and understand the conviction of the Holy Spirit in your heart, you can still turn away from those false things to follow Christ alone. No one is either too young or too old to be saved. Too young or too old to be renewed by the living Jesus. No one is too spiritually dead to be made alive by His grace. All you need to do is call out to Him in faith. And he will do it. Let's pray. Father, thank you so very much for the invitation you give to all the world through Jesus Christ that any might call upon Christ and be saved. Father, and I would pray for those who have not yet done so that this would be the moment that they see you and all your glory for who you are, see Jesus as the Son of God crucified for their sins, for every act of lust, for every evil deed, for every evil thought for all the ways they turn against you, for all the lies that they believed, help them turn away from those things to the truth of Jesus right now, asking Jesus to forgive them, be their Lord, be their Savior forever. Or give them the words they need to cry out to you in faith and save them. Father, help us abide in Christ. Help us keep our eyes on our Jesus and that we might serve you forever. We love you, Lord. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.